Hello, and welcome to MRA's 5-Minute HR Feed, the podcast where we share quick and practical information. In the time it takes you to go grab a cup of coffee, you'll gain insights into hot topics and pressing HR issues. I'm your host, Nicole Morehouse, and we're glad you're listening. Before we start, here's our usual disclaimer that the information being shared is not and should not be considered legal advice. Now let's dive into our topic. In today's podcast, we're going to look at the two most critical scripted statements to teach your managers and supervisors. Now, we don't expect our managers and supervisors to have theater training. Typically, the ability to memorize lines is not part of a performance evaluation. Yet, committing two specific lines to memory can help minimize the risk of significant liability. So what are those two lines? I'll get to them shortly. You know for sure I will cover them within the next five minutes, but they relate to employees and their medical issues. And as you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act is a federal law that levels a playing field for employees and applicants with disabilities. It has two major components concerning employment. First, employers must provide reasonable accommodations to qualified individuals with disabilities. Practically speaking, if someone cannot perform an essential function of their job because of a disability, but there is some accommodation or change in the way the work is done or to the workplace that enables them to do it, then we need to provide that accommodation. So here's an example. Imagine Maria is a greeter at a big box retail store. An essential function of her job is to stand by the front door and greet customers, make sure they know where they're going, be pleasant, be friendly, look around, make sure everything's nice and clean. She just had surgery to deal with arthritis in her knee and cannot stand for more than a minute or two. She requests an accommodation of being able to use a stool for her job. If it's not an undue hardship to provide a stool, we must provide it. So the ADA intends that employees are able to activate this ADA protective machinery easily. They don't have to use fancy language or even reference the ADA. All they have to do is let the company, usually their manager or supervisor, know that they're having trouble with a part of their job due to a medical condition. As soon as the manager hears this, the manager needs to inform HR and tell the employee to talk to HR. HR will lead the discussions to figure out the suitable accommodation. And as you may know, the discussions are referred to as the interactive process. So HR needs to take the lead in those discussions because HR is the only entity that should be asking the employee about their medical situation. Managers shouldn't have any information on this. This is why medical files are kept separate from personnel files. However, some managers don't know exactly what to do when that initial request comes in. Do we refuse to talk to the employee because it's medical? No, we focus on the job. The manager should ask, how can I help you? The employee will say, I need a stool, I need a schedule change, or maybe they'll say, I don't need anything. The manager should document the conversation for HR and share the information with HR. To the extent that that interactive process needs to move forward, HR takes the lead. That's the first scripted line, how can I help you? The second line helps the manager avoid those medical conversations, but it also ties into the other key component of the ADA. The second component of the ADA is that it prohibits discrimination against individuals based on their disability or based on an impairment that the employee either has or is perceived to have, even if they don't actually have. This latter piece is called regarded as disabled. It's against the law for an employer to base an employment decision on a medical condition. If that is the reason for the adverse action, the person can sue. So let's see how a regarded as claim would play out. Let's say that an employee named Gary applied for a promotion, but Gary was rejected. Gary was wondering what may have happened to impact his chances. He thinks back. He remembers telling his manager about one one month before he applied that he would be late once a week because of appointments with his therapist. His manager had said, therapist, why are you seeing a therapist? I can feel the HR professionals cringing over the internet right now. Mm, Gary thinks he was curious. So I told him that I was struggling with anxiety and look what happened. Gary is now connecting the adverse employment action with his employer's knowledge of his condition. Here, knowledge is indeed dangerous. What should the manager have done instead of asking Gary about the therapist? Here's a line. I'm happy to help you with anything you need to do your job, but if it's anything medical related, please talk to HR, not me. You can paraphrase it. Please talk to HR about anything medical related. The manager needs to focus on the job and tasks and send the employee to HR to discuss medical things. Now, what happens if the employee blurts information that they later claim is the basis for that employment decision? Following the same script is still the best possible action. Go talk to HR about anything medical related. 
The manager focuses on the actual job tasks and requirements at hand and should have no further discussion about the medical piece and wave away any attempts by the employee to engage, engage in that discussion. Thanks for joining me for today's podcast. Thank you for listening to Emory's 5-Minute HR Feed. Be sure to follow and connect with us for more podcasts and updates. If you're a member and have questions, you can always connect with Emory's 24-7 HR hotline by emailing infonow at emorynet.org or by calling 866-474-6854.